Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Walmart cloud native platforms and how we have extended Kubernetes to uh, build a control plane and deploy applications out to thousands of clusters. So uh, whenever any of us think of Walmart, right, uh, we do think of the world's uh, largest retailer. And we think of thousands of stores, and some of them mega, mega stores. And we also think of new age commerce. Uh, we think of online and omnichannel commerce. And we also think of next generation in-store retail. And a majority of these applications are uh, built and run on the Walmart cloud native platform, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So uh, first, we'll just uh, uh, go over an overview of the platform to get an idea of what this platform is and what it does, and then uh, dive into how we've extended Kubernetes and managed application orchestration across the platform. So Walmart began its cloud native journey uh, with Kubernetes clusters being adopted at Walmart stores. This is what we know as uh, call our edge uh, uh, location. And after that, our cluster footprint gradually increased and moved into the cloud as well, uh, which would be Walmart's private data centers, as well as uh, public clouds that Walmart is using. Uh, after this is when we actually started designing and building our control plane which we did over multiple phases. And right now, our platform is the go-to platform for new applications being built and developed in Walmart. Uh, so the platform itself, at a very high level, is a GitOps-based uh, platform. It allows application developers to focus on their application code. And from then on, the platform manages pipelines for testing, integration, and deployment of applications to production. Uh, and it's a fully batteries included platform that integrates with the entire Walmart developer ecosystem and provides a secure environment for running our applications in production. And uh, lastly, it allows developers to focus on their application code and takes care of everything from that point on. So uh, operating this platform at Walmart scale, right? So what does that mean? Uh, so Walmart scale is pretty big. We have thousands of stores. We have thousands of clusters deployed to each of these stores. And this forms one digital geography, which we call Edge. And the second digital geography that exists for us is in cloud, where we have uh, uh, clusters deployed in multiple regions and multiple countries as well. And uh, uh, this provides a very diverse environment in which we need to run and operate our controllers and our uh, control plane. And over the years, we initially grew a lot in Edge, and then we started growing in cloud, and we continue to grow a lot in Edge, and as well as in, in the cloud. So extending Kubernetes. So uh, generally, when we think of extending Kubernetes, uh, we think of Kubernetes custom resource definitions, which is uh, the way that we have also gone about in extending Kubernetes. And uh, combined with our custom controllers, this allows us to implement our entire platform's business logic. Uh, the custom resources uh, are used to store the platform state. These can be uh, combined into three major categories. The first is inventory, the second is networking, and the third is namespaces and applications. And uh, the namespaces provide us an abstraction to manage multi-tenancy in the platform. And applications provide a mechanism to uh, deploy applications out to multiple clusters. A uh, high-level overview of the platform, uh, the control plane architecture itself. So uh, you have your groups of resources. These store the platform state. Uh, some of these controllers interact with resources provided by other controllers itself. So for example, your inventory controller would generate monitoring resources to monitor your inventory, and it would generate uh, networking resources to manage the DNS records. So you can load balance requests coming into a cluster, or you can have an A record to uh, deploy, uh, to reach an application that is deployed out to a cluster. And on the right side, what you see over here, so these are our workload clusters. And we have a controller that runs in each of our workload clusters as well. And uh, 
that uh, the, and what you see on the left side is our control plane cluster. So there would be one control plane cluster, but several thousand workload clusters. So application orchestration, right? So when we peek under the hood, um, there are three main facets of application orchestration. The first facet is the hub and spoke design, which is what I just spoke about. You have a central controller, which is your hub, and you have an endpoint controller, which is your spoke. And the way we have uh, implemented this is we have a multi-cluster application specification. Uh, this is generated by a GitOps pipeline, right? So a uh, uh, developer writes code, commits it to Git, a pipeline is executed, which generates a multi-cluster application specification. Uh, that specification is then reconciled by the controller, generates a cluster application specification, which uh, represents a single deployment to a cluster. Uh, when I uh, say deployment here, I don't mean a deployment in the Kubernetes sense of a deployment, but I mean a Helm release. We treat Helm as an atomic unit for managing uh, releases out to our workloads, uh, clusters. And uh, the endpoint controller in this case, it synchronizes uh, an application specification and then triggers a job which actually manages uh, deployment and all the hooks necessary for uh, before a deployment and then after a deployment. The second facet of design is in fleet orchestration. So uh, here you can see a multi-cluster application specification. It uh, provides a Helm chart and a set of values and then a set of targets to which this application needs to be deployed out to. And uh, we allow uh, developers to provide a static list of targets, which is pretty limited and generally used in our uh, lower environments. But in production, we allow developers to uh, target a fleet of clusters. And for about 80% of the use case, we have platform-defined fleets. But for about 20% of the use case, we need to allow uh, application teams to provide their own uh, cluster fleet specs. And cluster fleet specifications itself can be defined in two ways, either a static list of clusters or a bunch of label selectors. And we also have a controller that would, based on a cluster fleet spec, uh, generate a list of clusters, because inventory is always changing. A cluster can be added, removed from inventory. And uh, in that case, we need to keep an updated version of our fleets. And the third facet of uh, our uh, application orchestration is about how we manage to scale this whole thing up. So uh, again, on the left side, you have a cluster application specification, which is reconciled. You have a, a specification for each individual cluster. And this is synchronized to the endpoint. But our endpoint uh, clusters are of two types. One run in an edge location, where CPU memory network is very restricted, and we need to conserve on those resources. And the second kind of uh, environment we operate in is cloud, where all these resources are available in plenty, and uh, we can easily synchronize uh, a large number of resources instantly. Uh, so to scale up and handle the thousands of edge locations that we have, we uh, also maintain an index of every cluster, which uh, is updated whenever any single application deployed to that cluster changes. And uh, this single index, which is less than a KB in size uh, normally, is what is synchronized to an endpoint. So it's pretty low on network. The second aspect of scaling up is uh, our deployments are actually executed by Kubernetes jobs. So uh, these jobs are triggered by the endpoint controller. And the jobs itself are where most of the resources get used up during a deployment. And this allows us to keep our endpoint controller pretty lightweight on CPU, memory, as well as network. Uh, and this has really helped us in scaling out to Edge, where these resources are very restricted. And generally, deployments in Edge also happen at night when stores are closed. So uh, that time, we do have a few more resources available uh, to deploy new versions of an application out. Um, so why did we do all this, right? Uh, 
The control plane design and its architecture began in 2019. At that time, there was a community called SIG Multicluster. There were a lot of projects under that community. And uh, we still went and designed and implemented a custom solution. So the main reasons for this was uh, our edge environment was very different from what most of the pro uh, these projects were targeting. So we needed to focus on WCNP edge. And that really required a custom solution. The second reason was uh, uh, that we had a unique set of challenges in the sense that our control plane uh, uh, came after the platform itself. So we built the control plane after we already had a large chunk of the platform uh, running in production. And uh, the last reason was one of the design goals in our control plane architecture was to offload as much as we can to the Kubernetes control plane itself. So we did not want to reinvent the wheel in the sense of creating maybe a multi-cluster deployment and a multi-cluster stateful set or a multi-cluster daemon set. We wanted to uh, rely on Helm and then rely on the Kubernetes controllers to manage deployments, replica sets, stateful sets, because Kubernetes does that really well. And we wanted to be able to leverage that. But we still wanted to be able to represent our namespaces and applications in an abstract form in a control plane. Um, and the easiest solution for that was to build something of our own. And uh, because the community projects out there did not fit exactly what we were looking for. Um, so some of the lessons that we learned along the way, right? Um, and some of the challenges that we faced. So one was building performance controllers, uh, especially when talking to external networks and uh, making external API calls. Performance of a controller is uh, important in very two key aspects. The first is uh, ensuring that your reconcile loop finishes really quickly. And then the second is in ensuring that, say, if your controller restarts, you do not bombard and DDoS an external service. So uh, we did face challenges around that, and uh, we have been able to fix all of those challenges. Uh, one of the other challenges that we faced was with scaling up the Kubernetes API server itself. Because as our platform scaled, there were a lot of requests coming into this API server. And we fixed that, or worked around that by caching almost all our platform state in memory. And most of the consumers of any platform state uh, use APIs and uh, get the data they need from a cache instead of directly from the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one other um, challenge that we faced uh, and uh, uh, was in local development and testing. So we solved this using Kind. Uh, as Kind became more stable, it uh, really solved the problem for us. So Kind is about running Kubernetes and Docker, which allowed us to run uh, everything locally on our laptop. And that really sped up the process for development for us. Uh, the other problems that we faced were around synchronization of the specification and status from a control plane hub to an endpoint spoke. And the last was on cross-cluster finalization. This itself is not really solved for us uh, completely, but we do not see any operational issues from it on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, it's something that we are still looking to solve. So if anyone has any ideas, please email me. We would love to hear these ideas. And uh, uh, you know, some of the things that worked well for us was extending Kubernetes. There was a lot of familiar familiarity in the team with Kubernetes. And extending Kubernetes was really helpful. Uh, the second major thing that worked really well for us was using Helm as an atomic unit and not using any of the Kubernetes core resources like deployments or stateful sets or daemon sets. Um, some of the things that didn't work well for us was in scaling etcd. We uh, have a pretty large etcd cluster at this point. Uh, etcd itself, uh, by default, comes with a 2 GB limit. Uh, as of now, we've increased that limit to 8 GB. And things are very sluggish when reading and writing to etcd. And this is a problem that we are looking to solve going forward. Uh, the last one I want to tell you about is about having monolithic CRD specs. So this is something you need to be very careful about when uh, designing a specification initially, because an interface once in place can lead to a code base that becomes unmanageable down the line. So some of the key takeaways for us 
the first one was to partition early. If we had partitioned early, we would not run into the problems with etcd that we have run into now. Uh, and another one uh, which are kind of related is for building for failure and outages and for implementing a robust and resilient feedback loop because our system is uh, distributed in uh, edge locations where network is patchy, there could be a storm, there could be an outage of one day, two days. And uh, uh, we uh, realized that as we scaled up and we hit more and more natural disasters at time or other issues, uh, we have seen operational issues arise from feedback loops that are not resilient enough for this environment. And uh, sometimes we've had outages itself of the control plane, and that has also been an issue for us in the past. Uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is uh, Kubernetes is a really great platform for building other platforms. It provides a lot of mechanisms to extend, and it's a great place to start because your team is already familiar with Kubernetes. But it's not always the end goal. The end goal is to build a platform, and sometimes APIs and databases and the way of doing things that we've always had works better. And uh, we hope to be able to open source things uh, in the future. Uh, we have shared in the, with the community in the past in a previous KubeCon, and we are sharing with you all again today, and we hope to keep doing that. And uh, we would love to hear from any of you all. So if you want to reach out to me, please do. And thank you for your time.